seeing that companies are now turning their cars into a service. Has anybody done the BMW Drive Now program here in SF? This guy, he's doing just about everything. <laughs> he's a heavy collaborator. Uh, so you can walk up to a BMW 1 Series, right? And you can maybe use your phone to open it. You can drive it. You can even reserve a parking spot and get out of that car. And you don't have to drive that car again. And that's BMW's Drive Now program, where the cars become a service. Toyota's doing the same thing, too. You can now rent those cars out. <coughs> uh, where's Playgo? Ah, yes. You guys heard of Playgo? Yeah. Okay, well, you're the CEO? CEO's here. So I have a, a baby, uh, Michelle has a baby, they're the same, pretty much the same age, and uh, she's 14 months. And uh, aside from Legos being very painful in the dark, one thing we know about Legos is you can outgrow them very quickly. So we have Duplos right now for, she's 14 months, 15 months. But do I need Duplos in two years? No, that's just for toddlers. So instead of me owning Legos, I'm, I'm a member, I'm a customer of Play, Playgo, they send me a new set of Duplos, and then eventually the next set, what's the next set after that? Lego, then Mindstorm, and I can just keep on evolving and I don't have to own it. So Playgo is Legos as a service. I don't own the Legos. He's sending it to me in a box. So I'm already doing that. And we're also seeing for consumable goods, even razors as a service with Dollar Shave Club. Brian's gonna talk about how he's helping this company uh, do this right now with Zora. So products as a service. Next one, Michelle and Stefan can talk about marketplaces a lot on today's panel. We're seeing services start to move and become <coughs> marketplaces. And what does that mean? Well, typically a marketplace is a two-sided model of buyers and sellers, right? Um, but now we're starting to see three-sided marketplaces emerge where corporations are getting involved. Take a look at this one. This is called the Common Threads Program, where eBay has partnered with Patagonia. Um, so who's wearing Patagonia today? He is. A couple guys are. Their brand is around sustainability. Their brand is about outdoors. So what they're doing is encouraging people to buy and sell their gently worn, well-loved goods on the eBay marketplace. And the reason why this is really interesting is it proves their commitment to sustainability even over trying to sell more shit. And it also shows that their products can withstand multiple uses and there's a thriving community. In fact, the proceeds from these profits go to nonprofits that the community can choose. So we're seeing marketplaces emerge. Now, for the Airbnb folks, imagine you were in the room with the CEO of Marriott and Hyatt and Hilton. What would you tell them to do with this disruption? What's up? Buy my company. <laughs> okay. <laughs> I, I know who you are. Um, so can they partner with Airbnb? Can they put up ads? Are there brand pages? APIs? No, 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 no. You can't do any of that. Airbnb has not partnered with hotels or given them an option. They can't even put their listings up on Airbnb. So I made a prediction on NBC a few weeks ago that in this year, we will see a major hotel chain launch their own version of Airbnb. And it might look like this, where the Airbnb starts to franchise the crowd and say, we want to sponsor and certify your home. And as a return, you get access to the value chain, the, the repeat sales and the loyalty program. You might get access to the soaps, the towels, and, even, and then Marriott, in this fictional example, could get 10% cut of a deal they never were gonna get in the first place. I expect this to happen this year. Okay, let's do the third and final model, and this one is called Enable a Platform, when marketplaces start to build products. We talked about Kickstarter, we know about peer-to-peer -peer funding, we know about 3D printers. The crowd is starting to build products. So what does a corporation do that's already in this space? And it requires them to use the co-word, which we already know in the word collaboration. But now we apply it to every single business department in our company. That's right. The crowd becomes part of our company. Crowdfunding, crowd designing, crowd building, crowd shipping, crowd 3D printing, crowd storing, and everything. In fact, in this future, we might not be able to tell the difference between a customer and an employee. It's the same. Let me give you some real-world examples. 
Did you know that U-Haul, yeah, that company, they allow for crowdfunding? You can be part of the U-Haul Investors Club tonight, and you can own part of these trucks. And after a period of time, you get a cut of those revenues. It's different than being a, a shareholder. That's a different type of value. This is a form of long-term shared fate. And on the other example, we're seeing companies start to use the crowd to innovate products. This is quirky, where the crowd submits ideas for new products. They're partnered with GE, and a small team at Quirky, the company, builds those and gets them on the shelves in Home Depot and Amazon. The crowd is part of that company, and there's a revenue share. And then also, we're seeing that Kelly Services recently partnered, partnered with Odesk, who's going to be one of our panelists where the crowd is starting to help and be part of your workforce. So we'll talk about that. Stefan, you can speak to that, right? So that is the collaborative economy value chain. And to repeat, there's a business model transformation happening. Products are becoming services. Services are becoming marketplaces. And marketplaces are building products. And this will kind of be a framework that we can set the stage for today's panelists. So with that, I'd like to invite the panelists up so we can dissect this even further. Come on up. Let's give them a, a round of applause. How are you guys doing? Great. Is anybody still depressed about the 49ers? <laughs> yes. A little bit. Yes, a little bit. I am too. All right, so the mic's on. Let's do a quick chest. I think so, yep. Hello? Are we on? Hi. All right, let's do some quick introductions. Michelle, can you tell us about your company and a little bit about what you guys are working on? Sure. Hi, my name's Michelle Regner. I'm the co-founder and CEO of both Desks Near Me and Near Me. And Desks Near Me has been our first peer-to-peer -peer marketplace. It's been a flagship product for Near Me. And Near Me is a peer-to-peer -peer marketplace platform enabling all types of um, anybody really to build a marketplace sharing economy without any coding experience needed on top of our platform. So anybody can have their own version of Airbnb or maybe an, an eBay, perhaps? Perhaps. The sky's yeah. the limit. Yeah. Okay, great. <clears throat> All right, Michael. Brian? I'm sorry, I'm sorry, Brian. That's my middle name, but I'll respond to it. Um, although if you knew that, I'd be very impressed. Um, uh, Brian Bell, I run marketing and uh, business development at Zora. Um, we essentially help uh, businesses in, that have a recurring revenue model uh, build, launch, and grow that recurring revenue stream uh, or, or build that recurring subscription business model. We do that by offering uh, a cloud-based uh, software application that manages uh, subscription commerce, so the ability to take transactions through multiple channels, subscription billing, uh, which gets increasingly complex in a recurring relationship uh, model, and subscription finance. So we deal with some of the finance complexities of running a subscription business. Um, we are uh, based down in Foster City. Uh, we're um, just about 350 employees. We have about 600 customers that range from um, you know, companies in the retail space like Dollar Shave Club up to companies like DocuSign and Zendesk and, and interestingly much larger enterprises like you know, Dell and HP, um, News Corporation, all these businesses that are pivoting to a recurring subscription model. Um, so very excited to be here. Great. Thank you. Stefan. Uh, hi. So my name is Stefan Castriel. I'm in charge of uh, product and engineering for Odesk. Uh, Odesk, for uh, people who don't know, is a marketplace for online work, typically for freelance work. And so what we do is we connect clients who are typically you know, startups like yourselves uh, with uh, freelance workers throughout the world. So you know, you're looking for an engineer, either part-time or full-time, or you're looking for an accountant, uh, somebody to do marketing, somebody to do sales. Growth hacking is a big thing these days. You know, we are a big source of growth hackers. Um, Essentially, anything that can be done remotely uh, is something that you would find. And we have about a million clients on one side, and I think close to 10 million uh, freelancers on the other side throughout the world. Uh, and then you're asking what we're working on right now. So one thing is you know, more of the same, just improving the, 
quality of the network, the ability to match people really seamlessly, extremely fast. You know, half of our jobs fill in the, in ne less than 12 hours, so it's a really, really fast hiring process. Um, you know, working to become even more mainstream, like going uh, up market, working with bigger and bigger clients every year. Uh, and then very tactically right now, we're merging with our, uh, one of our main competitors called Elance. So that That's keeps us news. pretty busy. That's yeah. really big news. So the two biggest players merged, Elance and Odesk. Um, great. So uh, I have a question. And Stefan, let's go back to you. Is this sharing or collaborative economy just because there's a recession going on? Uh, for example, we saw the government furloughs happen, and a lot of folks signed up to your service and TaskRabbit who were looking for jobs. We, I already talked about Airbnb happened during the Obama campaign. People didn't have money. And then Lending Club saw its, its birth in 2008. Is this just really because we don't have money? Why are people doing this? And let's pass it down to the other folks. Uh, you know, I, I really don't think so. Um, it's, it's been happening for a long time. Uh, you know, marketplaces in general, I don't know how many of you guys are trying to start a marketplace, but be patient. I mean, the, both Elance and Odesk are, you know, 10 plus year old companies. And it takes a long, long time to get these things to scale. And then at some point you hit some kind of tipping point and things actually accelerate. Um, but I think fundamentally there's you know, like two big trends here. One is on the freelancer side, uh, the younger people in particular just don't want to have the same boring jobs that our parents had. And if you talk to millennials, I mean, if you talk to kids who are in college right now, they just don't want our lives, are let alone any, the lives of our parents. Are there any millennials here? Okay, do you yeah. guys call yourselves millennials? No. So, but you find a lot of you know, like, um, you know, younger generations who say, hey, you know, I want to be able to work for whoever I want, be able to change jobs as often as I want, and frankly, to live from wherever I want. Um, and so that's all. That the, sounds very entitled. Yeah, it's uh, it's pretty cool though. I mean, the fact that you can do it. I mean, I wish I have four kids, so unfortunately, it doesn't work for me anymore. But the idea that I could be in Thailand right now doing you know whatever I am interested in doing and make you know probably more money, relatively speaking, given the, the cost of living there, sounds like a pretty attractive proposition. I mean, frankly, I think they're right. We were wrong. Um, so that's on the, on the one side. You know, on the client side, what's, what's been happening is, um, essentially, virtualization has happened. I mean, if you look at tech companies, so forget cons the consumer side, you know, the Airbnb, the Uber, uh, that's also happening. But on the, on the business side, you see the emergence of what's known as cloud computing, right? You've virtualized your storage, you've virtualized your network, you virtualized your um, whole hosting environment. The next thing you want to virtualize is, is your uh, engineering team, right? And the idea that you can hire really awesome people outside of Silicon Valley, you know, thinking that the best talent is always going to be within a five-mile radius is a little bit, uh, uh, you know, of a misnomer. So that's a huge trend that's been going on for a while. Thank you. So technology makes it happen. Millennials, those are great points. Anything else? Why is this happening, guys? Yeah, I, I don't... Um is it a, I think your question was, is it a recession-driven trend? I, I don't think that's the case. I mean, I suppose there are probably some of these businesses that were maybe accelerated um, because of the recession, right? But, uh, but fundamentally, I think it's some of the factors you mentioned at the beginning. It's, you know, technology trends, you know, just cloud computing, and, and the network enables this connectivity that didn't exist before. Um, I also think it's, and, and, and things like social and mobile certainly uh, fuel into that. Um, but fundamentally, I think it's really the acceleration of a trend that's been going on, you know, for all time, which is that consumers, people want access to goods and services, uh, you know, at any time, at any place, at the price that they want. And that is fundamentally what this is about, that, you know, all of these things, sharing economy, collaboration, it's just another sort of... Uh, enabler that allows people to get access to what they want in the way they want to consume. That, that sounds like yeah. entitlement too. It, there is an element of entitlement. I think there's also some socioeconomic trends. You know, if you, there, there are. If you look at demographics, you'll see uh, this idea of ownership is less important in younger demographics or in certain developed countries. That, that you don't need to own books or own CDs or own cars or own housing to have a high quality of life, and that's also driving So case. Lisa Gansky, one of my friends and I would consider a mentor, uses the term, it's about access over ownership. Yeah. That's the big trend, and I think she's right. Yeah, I think that's right. Yeah. Absolutely, it's about access, yeah. Okay, Michelle? I think I've um, both done a phenomenal job touching on all the points, but I think the, the last piece of it is is what kind of creates that tipping point. So these are all different ways that are 
bringing folks together is greater access to goods and but once we're a part of that you know what makes it thrive and to me that's um, related to the culture and the trust that's happening which we might want to step into but that's to me that's what creates um, these marketplaces to have the ability to to be powered is what are we gaining besides quick access to goods that people can otherwise get from other that they can't get from a corporation you know what can we get from each other um, and is it that experience with Airbnb um, is it the quick access is it affordability um, or also do people end up paying potentially a premium to have that experience that's something that we've been talking a lot about is um, you know would somebody eventually pay more to have access to an awesome experience um, so the tipping point for us has been um, really nailing and defining what that experience is when they go on Odesk, when they go on desks near me in our situation or any of these other marketplaces. And that I think is drawing people together. Technology has just catapulted it to the next level so that we can, you know, we've been renting and sharing things for centuries, but I think we're just- Like, like what? Um, things from our neighbors, borrowing from People down the block, people down the street. I am a new mom, and I think just I constantly tap into just my immediate network to buy and, and share things from each other. Um, but I've started using sites like Playgo and other areas that I can just use something for a short term. So access over ownership is, is really critical. Got it. How many folks here actually own a car? So way more than half of them. How many of you don't own a car? Wow. So that's about. Third, did you think about that, right? Yes, okay. I mean, we're in an urban environment, that makes sense. Um, I want to share this one quote I heard from BMW, and it was the, uh, it was this, the GM of the BMW Drive Now program that we talked about. And, and he said at a Stanford event that in the future, they can't sell any more cars because cities will be saturated with cars. You just can't sell anymore. So his quote, and I love this quote, is, in the future, we, we won't sell 1,000 BMWs. Instead, we want to sell one BMW a thousand times. So that was his their direct quote. You can see them already starting to change that business model. Now, um, this is a question, and we're starting to see this in the press. There's been a lot of negative things about this new economy. And we'll talk about the prefix and what to call this economy in just a second. Um, there was a very sad case of a, uh, a young gal, that was, a young child that was killed. We're also seeing that... Um, um, people are being evicted. Um, we're seeing that cities are starting to fight this. Help us understand, uh, the panel, um, when is society going to start to accept this? Or are we always going to have these types of struggles as we move from access to ownership? For example, it's not clear who's liable for those Airbnb hotels uh, or somebody gets hurt in front of them, or in this case of this young uh, child who got killed here in San Francisco. So. How will those, some of those big issues, as we move from, away from ownership to access, how will that be solved? Any thoughts? Go ahead. I, I was just going to give an anecdote of a story of, about the backlash, and then I'll comment on this. I was in uh, Paris two weeks ago. Some of you may have read about this. Anyone hear about the strike, the taxi strike in Paris? Two weeks ago? Yeah. So I arrived at Charles de Gaulle, went out to, cat, to, to get a cab. There's no one in the cab line. Didn't know about the strike. And, um, and you know, the, the guy comes up and says, there's no cabs. I said, well, what do you mean there's no taxis? He said, well, they're on strike. So I thought, oh, what am I going to do? So, um, you know, Uber actually has an operation in um, Paris. But what I didn't realize, I didn't put it together, the strike was against the Uber drivers. <laughs> so the, the Uber driver started going down the highway. And the, the cabs, talk about the level of disruption, the, the taxis were blocking the highways into Paris. So they weren't just on strike, they were actually creating disruption. They stopped on the freeways and the highways, and um, the, all the vehicles and the trucks I was essentially just sitting there in a parking lot trying to maneuver around them. Um, and I was told I had to sit in the front seat because that same day there were some uh, Uber drivers that were beaten up by cab drivers, uh, physically taken out of their car and beaten up. I mean, this that, is the that level news of never hit US. Did, did any of you hear about that? Yeah. Is, is, yeah. No, I know about the car yeah. vandalism, yeah. but the drivers being injured, that yeah. is? Yeah. Yeah. Wow. Yeah, it, it was, it was strike. And I, of course, I'm, I'm sitting in the front seat just hoping that we don't uh, get beaten up. But, um, I mean, I just share that story because it was really shocking to me that um, 
or, or it, was, it was really an indication to me that this is really disruptive. I mean, these new economic models um, are, are in, in my opinion, um, you know, not, not uh, stoppable, that they will continue, but it is disrupting many, many businesses. And That's it's right. not just the ones you mentioned. And, and we saw that the, the Paris government said there's now 15 minute waiting limits. So if you order Uber, you have to stand in front of the car for 15 minutes before you can get in. Mm -hmm. uh, that's called bureaucracy. And also, it's, it's interesting that, and that's a French word, I think. That's called the equalization of poor service. And, and um, I mean, it's French revolutions is something that is historically a pattern, so there's something to be said there. You can only laugh. Not to French. French. I didn't realize French, I signed sorry. up for French bashing tonight. Stefan. Stefan. That'll happen later. Yeah. So there's a lot of challenges. Uh, so the disruptions are happening, liability's an issue. How will some of these other things be solved? Michelle, Stefan. Well, Peers comes to mind. Um, What's that? Peers is an organization, a nonprofit, that um, has come together and is, is really trying to create a movement with the sharing economy and change policy and change it right at the city level, um, work with governments. Um, they've, I think Lisa Gansky is, is actually um, the founder of Peers, I believe. Um, she's on the board, there's a couple of different folks. Okay. Yeah. So I think that you know it's going to take more than a peers organization. Um, I think the crowd itself is is ironically going to be the ones to probably push it forward. And um, as these companies start to evolve and grow and, and really make a dent in different cities, that's when I believe that the government is going to have to kind of wake up and are there, modify. Thank you. Are, are there any members of peers here that signed up in the positions? Okay. Just yell out, why do you sign up for And so it's an advocacy group and you, you signatures and petitions and meetups and dinners. Just yell out, why are you doing that? I mean, it has to happen. It has to happen. What else? Protect our business. Protect your business. Good, uh, support the cause. Support the cause. I like the, the terms you use, protect, support. Um, I mean, it's like advocacy, you can feel it. That's deep, there's a movement happening here. So Piers uh, arranges for signatures. It's run by Natalie Foster. I saw her team today. She's former Obama uh, social marketing program. Powerful group. And they've raised 270,000 signatures to legalize this new economy and taking it to governments around the world. So it's pretty serious. Okay. Uh, Stefan, did you have any words on these challenges and how to yeah, I mean, I think, look, at the end of the day, that's what Michelle was saying, right? It's all about trust, right? I mean, if you think of, at the end of the day, yes, we have technology and we have a community, whatever, but like, the thing that really matters is the trust, right? And, uh, you know, it's probably a big part of our value as, you know, to our shareholders is to maintain that trust. And whether that means, um, you know, making sure that governments create laws that enable us to do our jobs properly, or just ourselves, you know, publishing ourselves to make sure that things go uh, smoothly, it is in everybody's best interest. You know, like it's ultimately a marketplace is, you said, you know, three parties. Well, there's always three parties. Right? There's a buyer, there's a seller, and there's the company. Uh, and, you know, there are going to be incidents like the accident with uh, Uber, but I'm pretty sure that the people at Uber take it extremely seriously and will do everything they can to make sure it doesn't happen again. So I'm going to challenge some of the statements put up by this panel. I don't want to cheerlead this movement. I'm obviously in it, and I'm helping big companies be part of this. But I'm going to challenge that it's maybe not right in helping everybody, OK? Just go with me. Is that cool? So um, a couple things. Does this actually erode workers' rights? If everybody's a freelancer, do you really get pension plans or health care or insurance? Uh, if everybody's parsed out just to be a freelancer, how does that really help people? In, in the long run. Panelists, any thoughts? That these are, and these are not just the criticisms I'm bringing up, we're seeing these come from economists as well, right? So is this really helping or just diminishing workers' rights? Uh, Stefan! You know, obviously I have to have an opinion about this. Uh, you know, at the end of the day, like, you know, just very selfishly, right? We take a cut of every transaction, right? So it's in my best interest to make sure that wages are as high as possible. And sorry for you guys as clients. But this whole idea that we might participate in, you know, reducing the whatever, like all the you know, crazy stuff you can hear from time to time is just not in anybody's interest, right? Like what I'm selling to you is, you know, empowered and talented human beings that are willing to give their time. If the best people don't come here because they have better opportunities elsewhere, then I don't have anything to sell. Right? So it's actually in my best interest to be 
to a platform that is incredibly competitive to local opportunities that people may have, so that I have top talent to, you know, frankly sell to you guys. Um, so, you know, like, there's a lot of uh, concerns about this kind of stuff, because I think it goes back to a lot of, you know, frankly, legacy providers that are concerned about this kind of stuff disrupting their, their model. And as usual, the big guys have a higher share of voice than the small guys, and we come in as you know, kind of the new people, the disruptors, and there's a lot of, you know, uh, you know, bad stories being made up. But the reality of it is our interests are really aligned with the interests of the rest of the community. The, this Uber case with the, the killing of that young child will be landmark. Because if the Uber driver has to pay up, it means that Uber did not support the rights of that, the provider. And that will set precedent that has dramatic effects. But if Uber does pay, that sets precedent too, that the, your types of companies are now liable, even as platform. So that is a landmark case that's gonna unfold over the next few years here. Hmm. I was just gonna comment, I, I don't, you know, I'm not an expert in any, in any way on sort of legislation around this. Um, I, I believe it will be worked out um, over time, probably with the U.S. leading, uh, or, or certain states leading that, that trend. I, I personally believe, though, in, in just the free economy and markets and that, you know, for, you know, in, in a free economy, it's always about getting rid of inefficiencies in the market. And that's what we're seeing uh, happen here. It's just a continuation of a trend that's been going on for a long, long time. And I think market forces will always find the right equilibrium there. Uh, yeah, there will be winners and losers here. There are companies that will lose out. There will be individuals that potentially may lose out with lower wages, but there will also be people who gain. And it could be people getting access to consumption or to uh, things that they couldn't consume before. You know, you couldn't consume certain cars before. You had to buy it. You know, does, does car sharing services create uh, greater opportunities for people that before could not get access to loans, for example? And, uh, uh, is it Upshift, your company? Yep, so he, uh, he's here and um, we've talked. So he's creating, can I talk, can I say what you're doing? Yeah, so he's, um, he's starting a, basically a car membership. So you have access and membership to a fleet of cars. And, and as you described earlier, you push a button, that car shows up and you can drive it. You don't own it, but you're part of a membership. And, and, we, and I said, gotta have a Tesla in the fleet because that will really hit off, right? <laughs> Michelle, we'd love to hear from you. Getting over these challenges. Yeah, I think related to, your original question was around 401k and, and all of these other benefits for an individual as a, as a freelancer. And I think that, as, as these gentlemen have said, that when you have access to all of these different avenues of work, that your idea of work and how you work changes. So the upside to that could be a lot greater than say, oh, I've got great health benefits or, or all of these other things. I think it comes down to personal values too. And, and there could be just a trade-off for what you might gain from working at, say, Google versus independently freelancing and maybe working the sharing economy, working all of these different sites or having a different type of resume. So I think it, I mean, there, there will always be large corporations to have that types of, those types of security. Um, but I think for the right type of individual, it's our companies, that all of these different marketplaces are giving that person access to goods, services, a different type of resume. That's great. So I've heard different terms about the economic model use, and I didn't really want to totally assert. Uh, so Brian, you said it's a free market, but some other people say this is about in enabling anybody to share anything uh, and distributing it, which some people equate to socialism. Uh, I hear things, people say it's, it's about distribution of wealth, enabling everybody to have a, a fair playing field. In, in, in two words, I just want to go down the panel, we'll come back. I'd like each of the panelists to describe what is this economic model or this business model. So just get in your mind and think about it, and then I'd love to hear it in two words, and then we'll come back and discuss it. Stefan, you want to give it a shot? Uh, I mean, why don't you start? I don't have two words. <laughs> I don't have a choice with the, with the term I use in my company. Uh, we call it the subscription economy. Okay, we'll come back to that. Any thoughts, Michelle? Okay, you can go a little bit longer. <laughs> <laughs> can we all agree it's a subscription economy? <laughs> yeah, <definitely>. <laughs> <laughs> um, then give us your shortest 140 character summary. What is this? New economy. 
I believe it's just an economy based on trust of gaining access to goods that we wouldn't have otherwise had. Okay. So I'd say placeholder as a service. So you know, in our case, it's talent as a service. Uh, Airbnb, it's you know, whatever you call it, hotel room as a service. But it's basically anything as a service, I would say. Okay, so subscription, trust, um, X as a service. I think these are all valid and true. Um, and so the, uh, the way I want to spur on the panel is, um, in the, which terms are going to end up being in five years to describe this? What do you forecast that this will be called? Five years, that would be 2019. What would we call this? I, mean, I don't think you call anything that's mainstream, right? I mean, like, once, once everybody's doing, oh, it's so commonplace that, you know, half of your friends are doing whatever it is that it is doing, and I think you stop having a name for it. So, it would just be called the economy? Yeah. yeah. Cool. Yeah, I, I think so. I mean, I, I agree with that. I think, you know, the reason at Zora we use the term subscription economy is because it refers to, you know, changes, this massive shift in consumption patterns. Um, and maybe later I can talk about some of the research we've done on this. Um, and moving to a subscription model, we use that term very broadly to mean usage base or monthly base, user base, something that is a, has a recurring aspect to the vendor, uh, you know, customer um, relationship. But the reason we use a term, and we don't just call it the economy, is because it is so fundamentally different. That, um, that when we talk to people in this economy, they don't fully appreciate that the way you run these businesses, the way you run a, a business where the, the relationship is the centerpiece, not the product, that that's so fundamentally different that we need to help educate and explain why that is. So I think until that's well understood, there will be a term use, use for, for whatever you want to call it. Yeah. Okay. Other thoughts? And then I'm going to list off all the terms that I'm hearing in this market. Well, why don't I do, why don't I do that? So here's all the terms. I, I put a collection on my blog post. Um, blue economy, circular economy, collaborative consumption, collaborative economy, cooperative economy, freelance economy, gift economy, green economy, maker movement, new economy, P2P economy, peer economy, shadow economy, share economy, subscription economy, the mesh and trust economy. We already heard four of those terms just from the panel. So there's lots of X economies being used out there. Anything else there? Yeah, again, I think if that's the question, well, why, why are people coming up with these terms? And I just go back to, it's different, right? There's an understanding that running these businesses is so different. The way you sell, the way you engage with customers, the things you focus on, the metrics you use to track, the way you build businesses, it's all completely different. And you know, eventually it will become, I think, mainstream. So let's talk about this change to on-demand. And by the way, we're going to open this, this up to questions from the group. Is there a fifth mic that can run around? If not, I'll, I'll run the room. Okay, I'll rather move. Okay, so let's talk about the changes. A lot of this is happening on demand. So subscription is a form of that. Marketplaces are a form of that. X as a service. Um, as that happens, how do businesses have to change? Uh, for example, if everything's on demand, do we really need retail stores? Do we really need warehouses? Is everything going to be delivered to you as you need it? How do things change? Panelists, love to hear. I think that the biggest change that a lot of these companies or, or corporations will experience is, is if they decide to, to play and take part in the shared economy, that they will fundamentally change things within their organization. So for example, if they're, they have a section of their business that's involved um, lending or sharing, like a Playgo or um, like a service, of any type of a service or a goods, that internally and logistically they'll have to make some, some serious changes. Um, from a platform perspective, um, that's shameless plug, but that's where we come in and are trying to kind of figure out how companies of all sizes can utilize technology to, to handle that and to streamline that process. Um, but I think that there will be a lot of challenges that they'll face in and how to move goods and, and jump into that that, they'll need to, that that won't be an overnight solution. That's right. So if, if car sharing truly takes off, it means cars are no longer idle, right? They're at over 90% utilization rate. With me on that? Because they're being used constantly. So it means that 90% of parking lots should go away. Right? In theory? <coughs> Just to add that. It's completely efficient. No. Yeah, yeah that's so. true. With like an Airbnb model, your prediction with, say, Marriott, um, I think that 
somebody like that to jump into this is um, probably going to have an easier time. They're in the business of heads on beds, and they're logistically set up to handle something like that. So I do feel, and I agree with your prediction on the side of, of a hotel chain being able to easily kind of jump into to this market and, and power up their own their own sharing. So cool. Brian, how does subscription business model, how does that change? Because basically people are pre-ordering, right? So why do you need a showroom or a floor or a warehouse if you're pre-ordering? Yeah, I mean, some of those things still have reason to exist. I, I think, you know, what changes, again, I'll go back to a comment I made before, but maybe just double click into it. You know, the, this idea that in, a, in the product economy, in contrast, it was about the center of that uh, relationship uh, the center of that economic model was the product, right? You were you had SKUs, you were shipping a product, all of your warehousing was around the product, uh, you, you priced around the product, you uh, measured your success based on number of units sold. In the subscription economy, it's about this idea of a recurring relationship, that the customer, and not even the customer, but the relationship with the customer is what is important. And that is a fundamental shift, right? It's about how many customers did you acquire? How are you servicing those customers? How are you uh, monetizing those relationships over time? And everything around that has to change. Um, you know, you don't care about how much revenue you did last year. You care about how much recurring revenue do you have going into the next year. You don't care about, um, you, you care much more about things like churn and retention. You don't care about, you know, how many units did I sell? What price point did I get on a given unit in a different geography? So it's a much more dynamic and, and relationship-centered model. And it's, there are, probably Jeremiah, these things around you know, warehouses and logistics, but we have customers like Dollar Shave Club that more so than Gillette probably has to invest in very sophisticated you know, warehousing on the back end. I think the more fundamental change is how you, how you run these internal operations, the commerce, the billing, the financial aspects of running these businesses. Supply chain. Stefan, for big companies that are working with Elance, Odesk, um, how does that change HR? Yeah, you know, so I'm, I'm glad you know you mentioned some of the big companies that have adapt, adopted, uh, you know, the, the disruption. But the truth is, they're still the exception, and we're getting to a point where it's really going to be adapt or die. Uh, if your competitors embrace this and you're resisting the change, it might take a while, but you're going to die. And you guys are all you know, new companies, you're all early adopters, it's not gonna to happen to you. But I'm sure you had some you know, trouble finding really good examples because most big companies still think the old way. Uh, and as it relates you know, specifically to HR, uh, if your competitor is more nimble than you, you know, like most of your costs are typically people, and if they're better at hiring the right people and better at you know, um, scaling up teams as a new product or a new service comes in and you can't do that, you're just gonna die. And, and we're definitely seeing this. I mean, now if you look at, um, you know, big Fortune 1000 companies, we have tens of thousands of people full-time on Odesk who work for these companies. And that wasn't the case two years ago, and it's definitely going to be a lot more in the next couple of years. Yeah, well, I don't, I don't have any uh, troubles finding examples of corporations. On my list, on my blog, there's over 60 corporations who have done something in the space. So it, it's already going. Um, I do have a question. Um, do you have any idea how many of of your uh, freelancers are actually moonlighting and they actually have full-time corporate jobs? I'm just curious. Yeah. Um, so that's a great question. Um, and it's the majority, right? So the, uh, the, one of the attractions of you know, freelancing is for people that want to do this for additional income or for the experience. You know, like you graduate from university today, one of the first questions your employer asks you as a developer, for instance, is you know, which open source software did you contribute to? Um, but if you have experience on your resume, it's pretty attractive to an employer. And you see a lot more, um, you know, college students who are, you know, extremely uh, qualified developers who, in addition to their regular homework, do, you know, 5, 10, 20 hours a week of uh, development work on, you know, a site like Odesk. That's interesting. Um, Jim, I, was gonna, and I wanted to share a data point of some research we did that speaks to this shift in large enterprises. We, we did, um, it was very frustrating for me in, uh, in my position, not seeing any research on this, really high quality research. So we uh, worked with the Economist Intelligence Unit to do a survey of 300 executives in the UK, North America, and Australia to see if they were seeing changes in consumption and how they were responding. 
And the data was shocking to me. It was four out of five executives. This is across industries. Four out of five see changes in how their customers are consuming services and products. And 50% were changing. They were in the process of changing their pricing and packaging of services to respond to that trend. And the biggest trend was 40% were moving to a subscription model, 27% were moving to some sort of shared economic model. That, I mean, that, that, those were to me staggering numbers to see that, that you know, across the world this, this shift is happening. And enterprises see it. The big established companies know this is going on. I think the question is, can they respond you know, quick enough and, and figure out how to re revamp their, their business model? Well, it, it's interesting. Um, so I run Crowd Companies, which is a council for the Fortune 500 who want to be part of this market. And they're all judged on Wall Street numbers which is maximizing revenue, reducing your cost. And to them, selling more shit makes that number go up. Yeah. So trying to reuse things doesn't make those things go up in today that we're measuring. So th th there's, there's a problem here uh, on how they're measured versus what is happening out of like the Soma district. Two different worlds. <laughs> um, any questions? I'd love to see some hands. Okay, I'm gonna start to, to, to work the room and I do have a, a final question. So I only have two things about questions. We'd love to hear your name and who you are, where you're from. And the second part is, it's got to be a question. <laughs> My name is Oren Gordon. I am a uh, media consultant. You mentioned uh, various as a service model. And it appears to me that uh, as the discussion uh, incorporated the, the, the freelance model, you were talking about people as a service, P-A-A-S and talent as a service, T-A-A-S. Um, I want to ask Stefan how far he thinks that this can go. Uh, do you think it could, we could reach a stage where executives are for hire and they move from company to company to lend their particular talents to the uh, problem set of a company, thus rendering the, I suppose, the uh, consultants of this world, the McKinsey's of this world, redundant and irrelevant. How, how far do you think this talent as a service and people as a service model can go? So I, I think question. the answer is those exist already, right? Whether you're looking at GLG, you're looking at M squared, I mean, there's probably 10 of those that exist. Whether they are CEOs who quit their CEO job to do this full time or not, I'm, I'm not sure. There's definitely a lot of executives, probably some of you guys in the room are already stunned on those sites who do this nights and weekends. Typically, you make quite a bit of money on this, and uh, you actually learn a lot in doing it. So I think that's happening already. Yeah, there was a new one um, where the Board of Advisors, they can, oh, it's called Clarity.fm. That just showed up on my feed last week, where if you, if you don't want to deal with the, the headache of dealing with the Board of Advisors, now you can get one on the marketplace on, on <laughs> Clarity.fm. I don't think you have to give them equity, <laughs> so that's great. All right, there's another question here. Yeah. Good to see you too. Uh, I'm Ian McHenry. Uh, we have a startup called Beyond Stays that uh, is kind of a neighborhood hotel built on top of Airbnb. Um, but I mean, my question um, for you guys was sort of, you mentioned that this would be easy for sort of Marriott to sort of jump into the sharing economy. Um, do you think the car rental companies will jump into it? And if so, will they do it themselves or will they look to acquire and get around a flight car or something like that? Well, you know about Avis, Avis. Car, Avis. Zipcar, right? Yes. Okay. <laughs> yeah. But then that's almost the next yeah. level, where those are still owned assets, where these are other people own the assets. Yeah, peer to peer, a peer to peer marketplace peer -peer. versus cars as a service. Gotcha. I'd say, from a car rental perspective, um, there, I think there's a huge opportunity. Um, we've been in private beta for about three months, and we've had a lot of discussions with car companies, not rentals like Hertz and so forth, but, but where car companies are looking at, at it from the same perspective as BMW, where they want to have somebody test drive their car through a get around, that sort of thing. So I definitely think there's room for, for the same to happen with, with an Avis and those folks to potentially dump their cars into that type of platform to have it as an even shorter term rental. Um, it makes a lot of sense. Is, is 